Welcome back. Today I'm going to build this. This is a UPDI programmer I designed and today I thought I'd start building this to see if it actually works and bring you along for the ride. I've gathered all the components I need and I also printed out the design but before we get to the through hole components, I'm first going to solder on the FTDI chip. How visible is that? Not really. So this is the FT231XS, which is the SOIC version of the FT231X. And this is a surface mount component. So I thought it would be easier if I got this out of the way and started with this one. So I've brought you in a bit closer um, and I'm going to try to solder it with the camera right here. But first I have to snap off one of the boards. Should just snap off. All right, that worked. Let me get some pliers to get this strip off. Massive pliers. I'm just going to bend it a little bit. Oh, there it went. And there we go. That's a pretty clean break. So what I'm going to do is first heat up the soldering iron, of course. And I'm going to set it to, well, 350, about there. And I have some flux in a syringe. For easy dispensing and I'm just gonna put some flux across the pads and for this surface mount I'm going to use some 0.3 millimeter solder wire and I'm just gonna tin one of the pads now I have to check carefully where pin one is pin one's over there so pin one over there on the board I have to turn it around. It's a bit difficult to see on camera, but that's a pretty good alignment. I'm just going to do the opposite corner to hold it in place. And now do the rest of the pins. All right, that looks pretty decent. Maybe just clean off the flux a little bit. All right, that will do for now. Let's do the resistors next. I'm gonna do R1 and R2, which are over there, and are the series resistors on the data lines of the USB. And these are both 27 ohms. How's that? Okay-ish. I'm on this side of the board anyway, so let's do R4 and R5 as well. And R4 and R5 are connected to one LED each, one is the transmitting LED indicator and one is the receiving LED indicator. Oh, and these are both 1K. There's a 10K resistor over there and another 1K resistor. I'm going to do that first. That's the resistor, current limiting resistor for the third LED, which is on the clock line of the SPI. Look at that. That's a horrible bend. Try that again. Yeah. 
and R6 is a 4.7K resistor and that's on the UPDI line. Uh, that's awful. Oh well, can't change it now. Next is one more resistor, that's R3, and that's a 10K pull-up resistor. Oh, that's 100K, that's not 10K. There we go, a 10K resistor. Now let's see if I can make a bit of a nicer bend. That's better. What else is low profile? Well, I guess the crystal is. This is a 16 megahertz crystal. That sits flush. Next, I'm gonna do the capacitors. Now, according to the design, the crystal needs two 18 picofarad capacitors to oscillate and I thought I had these but I don't. Now I dug around in my big bin of capacitors and I did find some 22 picofarad capacitors so I'm just gonna do these 22 picofarad capacitors and hope they will work. Next up are C1 and C2, which are two 47 picofarad capacitors on the data minus and data plus line of the USB. And these are over there, 47, and another one. Just two little balls of white tack to make my life a bit easier. Next up are C4, which is a 100 nanofarad decoupling capacitor between VCC and ground. And the other one is also a 100 nanofarad capacitor. And that's C3 and connected to the data terminal ready control output of the USB to serial chip. All right, a few more components to go. One capacitor, which is C7, which is a decoupling capacitor between VCC and ground of 10 microfarads. And I have two 10 microfarad capacitors over here. One is a pretty big one, 50 volts. That's a bit overkill. The other one is a 25 volt capacitor. Where does it say that? Over there. But I kind of messed up the footprint, which happens a lot when I use footprints for electrolytic capacitors because they're all different sizes. And usually I think, well, for the schematic, I'll just pick one and check the footprint later and then later never comes and I'm using the wrong footprint. So if I do a next iteration of this board, I can use a smaller footprint, but for now it's okay. Next, I'm gonna do the LEDs. Now it doesn't really matter which LED goes where so I'm going to do green for TX, red for RX and blue for the clock 
of the ISP. Next up is the Admega 328P. And I've got a bunch of them in this tube. And the last component, and I say component because I don't think these pin headers are components. This is kind of a component. Although that is also debatable. But the last one is the USB connector. All right, that's that. So I have some double row headers and some single row headers. And again, I'm gonna use my massive pliers to break six of the double row headers off for the ISP. And I need three for the UPDI. There we go. And that's the board done. And now I can plug it into the computer and see if I can, first of all, recognize this as a COM board. And second of all, program the Atmega 328P. And third, to see if I can upload a sketch to the AT Tiny using UPDI. Well, before I do that, I I think it's a good idea to check whether there's no shorts on the board. And I'm going to do that by plugging in this power meter into a USB extension lead. And then plugging the board into that to see how much current it draws. And if it draws too much, I know there's a short on the board. And if it doesn't, I think I'm safe to plug this into my computer. Here we go, let's see what happens. Well, that's 10 milliamps. That is kind of what I expected. And I'm now safe to plug this into my computer.